Brought to you by Moonbeam Multimedia. This is 16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. I'm great. How are you? Good. I want to hear a little bit about how you ended your week because you did a fun field trip with your students and I want to hear a little bit about it if you don't mind sharing. We did. My coworker and I, who do everything now together at school, um, we took over student council. I think Mm -hmm. I've talked about this already probably, but a couple of local schools have been having get togethers for student council groups. Uh huh. So you take five of your students and the advisors and the students get to like work and play games and, you know, share ideas and things like that. It's like, like an that. ideological exchange. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And so the thing is kind of like normally you go and tour the school and see what's going on there and get some ideas and meet their students and things like that. And then the second half of the day is like a tour of the community. Mm-hmm. Something that they can highlight. Yeah. This is the second one we've done. So We've learned a lot. I think anybody who gets signed up for student council knows it's kind of just trial by fire. Um, you know? I mean, it sounds. I think it sounds pretty cool to be able to get outside the boundaries mm-hmm. of the very small and often sometimes insular school community yeah. that you might know as a as yeah. a young student and see what other people are thinking about. Yeah, it was nice. Like I said, this is the second one we've done, so they've been fun. I don't know if we'll host it next year, or I'm sure we'll we'll get signed up shortly to do it but the thought is that every year two schools can host and kind of give a chance to go and see a new place and and the kids like seeing other schools you know so that I was kind of like well I don't know if I want to go on a tour of another high school but it actually ended up being kind of insightful and the kids really enjoyed it so it was fun neat so then the afternoon you like they feed you lunch and then they usually have like someone from the community come and speak and just kind of talk about what's going on um the first community development person yeah so the first one we we got to do a tour of the Cambridge, Ohio. They have the Dickens characters, oh, the people yeah. on the streets. Uh-huh. And so we got to meet with one of their caretakers and kind of learn about the process of, you know, these weird little characters that get right put up on the town. We're, these characters are kind of local legend. We, we knew about them growing up. And I think I told you this before, but when I lived in Maryland, there were people there that I randomly encountered at church who were yes. like, we get on bus tours to go, to go see, see these them. things in yes. Ohio. I'm like, yes. you drive seven hours to go look at these things? Uh-huh. And they're so, terrifying. Yeah, they're kind of strange looking. They are. Um, kind of like paper mache heads, but a nice little plug for Cambridge, Ohio. Uh-huh. And so this time uh, we were in Coshocton, Ohio. And we met with someone from their Port Authority and did a tour of a local business that's in the process of being brought back to life. Yeah. It's a fun opportunity. And uh, it was a nice way to end the week. It was a good Friday. Cool. We got to be outside and there was sun. That was nice. And then late Friday night, early Saturday morning, we got hit with four inches of snow that I didn't know was coming. (laughs) So that's Ohio. That's Ohio. So what about you? I haven't done anything as interesting. I did get to spend the last couple of days nerding out over Supreme Court case research, which, as it turns out... You're very into. I am very into. You are. I kind of forgot that I was very into this, but I am. So. I I can enjoy it in the spurt that we've done it, mm-hmm. and I'm good And then you're like, I don't need to do this again for a decade. Well, it's very dense reading. It is. That, that's probably why I like it. That probably is why you like it, and that I know that that's why I hate it. <laughs> because it's it's a workout. It is. To it, read them. It requires the flexing of some muscles, brain brain muscles that I haven't used in a while. But that's a, that, that is what we're talking about today. Just before we get to our headlines, I'll say we're doing or starting a two-episode series on Supreme Court cases that have shaped education in the United States. And um, if Chelsea has her way, this will be a 10-part series. Yeah, yeah no, only two. <laughs> I hope that these conversations end up being timely. So anyway, before we get into that, shall we start with our education news headline roundup? Our very first story is something of a follow-up from our last episode's uh, headlines, where we were talking about Dartmouth. Mm-hmm. Oh, and where is Dartmouth? New England. <laughs> It's up there. (laughs) (laughs) 
<clears throat> I didn't say I retained it. I just said that I looked it up. It's Dartmouth not Connecticut. In New it's Hampshire. New Hampshire. <laughs> and we're going to talk Duh. about <laughs> Of course it is. So last episode, we were talking about Dartmouth because they reinstated test score requirement as part of their admissions Mm. process. And so the update to that story is that very quickly afterwards, Yale, MIT, and Georgetown also followed suit in reinstating test score requirements for their college applications. There's a story in the Dartmouth, which is the student newspaper of Dartmouth, um, that talks about a rather tense office hours session that occurred on February 5th between university administrators uh, and students, where students were voicing concerns with the reinstatement of mandatory test score submissions. The students were arguing that this would result in a less diverse applicant pool. And as we discussed last episode, the college argues that, quote, tests when assessed in the context of meaningful environmental factors can be used specifically to help Dartmouth expand access and enhance diversity, end quote. So Dartmouth is making the case that this helps them diversify their applicant pool. Dartmouth students are making the case that this doesn't diversify their applicant pool. So Hmm. kind of an interesting conflict uh, unfolding there. I did want to note this is really only tangentially related, but there's other Dartmouth news from just this past week. And that's that the college just settled Uh, in a class action suit that involved 17 elite universities that alleged that they engaged in an anti-competitive tuition price-fixing scheme that may have disadvantaged certain applicants due to their financial status. So that is just very interesting (laughs) timing Mm -hmm. given this decision about test scores. So anyway, uh, yeah, that's the update. Other colleges are following in Dartmouth steps, kind of like we predicted that they would. We had one listener follow-up question about this story about Dartmouth. And I thought it was kind of interesting. This listener was asking, is involved in in higher ed leadership and was asking about how colleges with test optional admissions policies, how administrators at those places could know whether or not their admissions and recruitment processes are successful. Especially in the absence of test scores, how Mm -hmm. do we determine that we're doing a good job finding the right students to come join us Mm -hmm. at our educational institution? My off-the-cuff response to that was to look at retention as a pretty strong indicator, and then also just whether or not students had made academic progress. Now, I'm not talking about, like, GPAs and test scores and, like, whether they come into a university with Mm -hmm. good indicators of whatever that sort may be, but whether or not they make progress from where they are when they enter to where they are when they leave. Those those two things to me seem to be good places to look. Yeah, I still have an open question about what an application process looks like if you're not relying on test scores and have found some other way to reliably determine how good a fit a student is. Yeah. A sticky wicket. A sticky wicket. Anyway, second headline... The Chicago Board of Education has voted unanimously to remove school resource officers from Chicago public schools by the start of the next academic year. This decision followed years of debate and advocacy driven by several key factors. So the first key factor is concerns about racial disparity. There is data that shows that black students were disproportionately disciplined and arrested by the SROs, uh, which raises concerns about implicit bias and then contributing also to the school to prison pipeline. Yeah. Studies haven't consistently shown that school resource officers improve overall school safety, which makes you wonder about, you know, generally their effectiveness. Um, Critics argued that SRO presence could create a more punitive and stressful environment, and that could hinder student-teacher relationships and also the learning. So the board's resolution directs CPS to develop a new holistic safety plan by June of this year, 2024, which must explicitly ban SROs from schools. Uh, This plan will need to address concerns about safety, student well-being, and staff training, and allocate resources for alternative safety measures. Overall, this decision is is pretty controversial. Some argue that SROs provide a valuable security presence, and others are concerned about potential negative consequences of their removal. This case is part of a larger national debate about the role of police in schools and what are the best ways to ensure um, a safe place and equitable learning environments for everyone. Yeah, I was looking at some of the numbers it was definitely only a portion of Chicago public schools were even 
making regular use of school resource officers. It was, I, I can't remember what the numbers were, but it was like a few of the schools out of the 600 or something of them <laughs> um, had school resource officers. And some principals from some of those buildings were making the case that this was going to negatively, this motion, this move to get rid of the officer program was going to negatively impact our school safety um, situations. Huh. And we hear that a lot, but I think the response to that in the articles that I was reading is like, these programs do address safety concerns, but the addressing does not necessarily happen in the form of preventing safety incidents. Mm -hmm. So I think that's more the sort of advocates for, for the restorative justice and the kind of like mental health uh, approach to these kinds of issues. That's, that's where they're coming from. So anyway, this is definitely a growing trend. Uh, Chicago is a big public school district to be taking such a step. Like the mayor of Chicago is involved in advocacy for this. It's kind of, it's, it's a deeply polarizing issue, but we'll, we'll keep an eye on it and see it. I, I just want to know, I want to know how it goes in these places that make these choices. Like Mm -hmm. I want the follow through to say, this is what changed. This is how it changed. Mm -hmm. This is what we're doing now. Cause, cause I do have concerns when any kind of school resource is taken away And when advocates say, well, we're going to try this instead, a lot of times the school funding situation just means that a thing has been taken away and nothing nothing ever steps in to take its place. So anyway, our last headline for the week, Harvard University is forming a working group to explore formalizing a policy of institutional neutrality following recent controversies involving pro-Palestinian and pro-Israeli student demonstrations that kind of ultimately wound up in this situation where the president of Harvard resigned, Claudine Gay. There are a lot of complications here. Like, when is someone speaking as an individual? When is someone speaking as a representative of an institution? When is it appropriate? Or when do we even kind of expect institutions to comment on current events? And seeing as how we're about to do this a couple of episodes on Supreme Court cases and education, I, I... Felt like it was probably a good idea to include a few notes on this case anyway, but I'm going to bring it up and I always hammer this home with all friends and relatives. They're sick and tired of hearing me talk about this case, but Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. Um, This is the case uh, where in a 5-4 decision, the majority opinion contested that corporations and other associations have First Amendment rights, including the right to free speech and that the government cannot ban independent expenditures even if they support or oppose candidates as long as the spending is not coordinated with a campaign. So whether or not one agrees with this ruling, I want to say that it kind of arranges our political playing field in a certain way and almost sets up businesses for failure (laughs) in the way that Harvard is now kind of scrambling to try to address. And here's what I mean by that. If money is speech money is influence and money is politics and consumers who participate in a political economy like this are consequentially going to see their spending as a kind of speech or political influence. That's just like a kind of natural consequence of this. We're going to feel like our choices to spend money with particular companies are an act of explicitly aligning ourselves with the political ideals and morals of those companies because It's kind of what this ruling has created. Mm -hmm. And I think it's reasonable to expect that consumers don't want to spend money with corporations that are explicitly working against their political interests, whatever those interests might be. This is not a one side or the other kind of thing. So we've got this situation where consumers in this system are going to demand that institutions take positions about all sorts of incredibly complicated political and economic and whatever issues. And... I think that insofar as corporations continue to have the rights that they do that are you know, protected by the Citizens United ruling, consumers are going to continue to demand transparency from institutions about complicated issues. So I think this system, one, I think it has the side effect of polarizing us and making division and instability more prevalent. But I guess I just don't know how Harvard is going to get away with pursuing institutional neutrality when the volume is turned up as Mm -hmm. high as it is on these things. Because, yeah, I think we're just in the situation where it's now a political norm and expectation that a company providing a good or service to people is going to 
have something to say <laughs> on on any number of issues. And until we disincentivize that, we'll just keep perpetuating this yep. circumstance. Mm-hmm. Anyway. That's a sticky wicket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you think about this move from Harvard? I think I think I was reading like University of Chicago also has a policy of not commenting on current events. I'm curious as a as a public employee <laughs> what you think about that. I hmm. you're not going to comment on mm-hmm. current events. <laughs> <laughs> I can see how Harvard got themselves into this situation, but I can also see how silence is an act of, like, it's complicit, right? Like, that's the hard thing, is that it's seen as being, yeah. Yeah, that's the that's what I'm trying to argue, is that yeah. Citizens United makes, it puts everybody on the same page in agreeing that silence is complicity, I right. think. And yeah. that's how it feels, too. Yeah. So I'm, like, hearing Harvard, and while I can understand why they wouldn't want to, I can also think, you cowards, say something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is exactly the point, right? Yeah. This is going to create, for Harvard, an incredible complication of trying to determine when somebody is speaking on behalf of the university and when they're just exercising their free speech rights to say whatever they want to say. And at what point, it it would be interesting then to see when they do make a statement, like what that situation would be. Yeah. Like, that's the hard part is like by not making any, okay, but when you do, then what? What are you going to be answering to for all of the other things you never had a peep about? I don't know. Yep. Ooh. Yep. <laughs> I'm glad I don't work in their legal department because I don't want to think about it. I, that's. Mm-hmm. I can understand I how not saying a, anything is easier. Yeah. Technically. I, th- I think this policy review that they're conducting or this working group or whatever, I think it's like a faculty working group and now it's kind of being like pushed forward and now maybe the office of the interim president is kind of considering it. I forget where exactly it is along the way in this process, but they're still kind of, they're still considering it. Is This isn't, this hasn't been officially adopted or anything yet, but they're having the conversation certainly yeah. uh, at a time where it's media icky. scrutiny about this is turned up to 11. So yeah, I just, ugh, I'm like tense thinking about it. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. Because there will be a time when they do say something. Yeah. And even if their situation is to not, they they will eventually. But what could that possibly be about? I don't know, man. That's a tough one. But I also, can I say one more thing? Mm -hmm. Like, I think that colleges and universities being silent is dangerous to people who look to them for information. Yeah. Colleges and universities are, I I agree with you, I think they're in a unique position because they are institutions of learning. Right. Like like your whole entire mission. So when they make a comment about something or a statement, that to me is like, I mean, I don't want to be too broad here, like a a quote unquote well-informed, you know what I mean, statement. And so, or they can be, or they should be, (laughs) but yeah, but also often aren't. Right. And so that's, I think my hope is like that they are a well-informed group making a statement, but you're right. They're not always. So thanks. I hate it. (laughs) That's where I've landed. I think it's important to note both how much and how little progress has been made (laughs) as far as the relationship between law and schools in this country. A lot of these questions that we treat as settled are not settled, like at all. Yeah. Laws come into existence and go out of existence and change. Rulings themselves can be made and unmade. Or they can vote and then put out a statement in which they clarify this part of their vote does this, but they don't agree with this, this, and this. That's what I read a lot about. Yeah. Supreme Court opinions are really fun to read. Are they? And they can be, yes, because they're, they're like the most official sounding documents, but at the end of the day, they can tend to be like the pettiest. Right. Like these people are just getting into little petty squabbles with one another across the bench. Over words. Single word. But I would just be reading and then I'd be like, okay, well, then Sandra Day O'Connor actually wrote after voting for that. This is where <laughs> I was like, so you, you did vote for, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, They'll qualify and attach uh-huh. caveats and it's fascinating to me. So 
would you like to start with our our case number one? Yeah. With, okay. Let me just jump right in. The story does not start in 1954, but that is where our story starts. Our timeline begins. Yes. We're starting off with the big one. Brown v. Board. This is Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka. Yes. This landmark decision overturned the separate but equal doctrine established 60 years earlier in Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy ranks with the Dred Scott versus Sanford decision of 1857, and that ruled that African Americans, whether free or enslaved, could not claim United States citizenship. That's up there as one of the worst Supreme Court rulings of all time. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Dred Scott is seen as the worst, I think, but okay. th- but this does rank indeed. Great. Okay, mm-hmm. so here we go. So Plessy versus Ferguson. That ruling upheld a Louisiana law requiring separate train cars for white and black passengers. That's the separate but equal. Homer Plessy was a mixed race man who had the backing of the East Louisiana Railroad Company, which didn't want to bear the added expense of paying for additional Jim Crow train cars. Yeah. <laughs> the trains were like, yeah, we don't want to pay for this either. So we're going to join your civil yeah. rights case. <laughs> so they intentionally violated the law to challenge it. And argued that it violated the 13th and 14th Amendments to the Constitution, which outlawed slavery and guaranteed equal protection under the law, respectively. So in the 7-1 majority opinion against Plessy, Justice Henry Brown opined that separate facilities were legal as long as they were equal in quality and that segregation itself didn't imply black inferiority. And this lasted for 60 years. That's a sentence. I can't believe I just read. 60 years this lasted. This was the law of the land until Brown v. Board. Okay, so here we go. So Brown v. Board is the name given to a collection of five different cases that were combined into one ruling, which partially overturned Plessy and established that racial segregation in public schools, even if the school facilities could somehow be shown to be equal in quality, violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. So the Browns and then 12 other families from Topeka, Kansas, filed a federal class action lawsuit against the Topeka Board of Ed, challenging the constitutionality of segregation in public schools. The Browns and other complainants opposed a district policy that forced students to travel farther away to attend segregated schools when white schools were physically closer to black residents' homes. In 1954, the Supreme Court issued a unanimous 9-0 9-0 decision in favor of the Browns, ruling that, quote, separate educational facilities are inherently unequal, end quote. This is going to come up again and again, and I actually just pulled out the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, but let me just go ahead and read it. It says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. A couple of points of discussion here on Brown versus Board. This ruling focused on ending de jure segregation. I think the conversation has now shifted to address issues of de facto segregation. So, you know, residential patterns, school funding disparities, implicit bias, all this stuff that we're constantly talking about on this show. That's where the conversation now lives. And I guess to that, I'd just say that it seems like litigation alone is not going to suffice when it comes to achieving educational equity. And I'm interested in broader social reforms that Mm -hmm. that might be necessary to make this happen this feels like the uphill battle right like that's what we keep talking about these are all the things that become part of these conversations yeah i think it's so interesting how a supreme court case can seem so momentous but at the end of the day it still kind of comes down to what's on paper in a lot of these places it comes down to local and state legislatures making sure that they carve out rights for students. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think we still have a long way to go when we consider the social structures against which all of these cases unfold. So, okay. Next. Next case. We're fast forwarding to 1962 in a case, a couple of cases actually that kind of go hand in hand. The first one is called Engel versus Vitali. And the second one is Abington School District versus Shemp. These cases both are dealing with the separation of church and state in public education Engel versus Vitali. This is 
a situation that arose in 1958 when the New York State Board of Regents, uh, that's kind of the governing body of public schools in New York at the time, the Board of Regents composed a short prayer to be adopted by schools across the state for voluntary use in morning activities. And I actually put the little prayer in here. It's very short, but this is what the issue was over. The prayer goes, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Amen. Amen. That's the prayer in question. A group of families of students from the Herrick's Union Free School District sued the school board president, arguing that the voluntary prayer written by the state board of regents to Almighty God contradicted their religious beliefs. Hmm. A plaintiff's religious and philosophical identities were enumerated in court paperwork. Uh, Judaism, atheism, a Unitarian church member, and a member of the New York Society for Ethical Culture, which didn't sound religious as much as philosophical, but that's interesting. I want to go see what that is. So anyway, in a 6-1 decision, the court held that reciting school-sponsored or government-authored prayers violates the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. And that's that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of a people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The lone dissenting opinion in this 6-1 decision stated that the First Amendment was only intended to stop the establishment of a state-sponsored church like the Church of England, for example, and that the voluntary nature of the prayer and its supposed non-denominational nature meant that there was no constitutional challenge. Now, the voluntary thing, I think, is much more difficult, but I don't know how this prayer can be read to be non-denominational It starts with Almighty God. (laughs) That in itself I'm a person who is interested in and cares about religion and different religions and the way people practice sure. them, all kinds of different things yeah there's no way i would read this as and think it applies to everybody i mean it might be non-denominational in the sense that like methodists and baptists could both get on board with it all are, of the christian flavors are probably well covered yes but. yes that's the issue is that all the flavors of christianity are covered none of the flavors of non-christians buddhism Taoism, okay. any, yeah. yes any non-christian i'm not really sure they're not gonna be yeah i mean some of them the phrasing might work for some of them, but probably not for others. So That's true. anyway, yeah, maybe for some it would, but I don't think we should assume for all. <laughs> I brought up that dissent because very similar reasoning continues to be used as religious cases keep being brought before the court. Like th- this comes up again and again. Uh-huh. Um, the, this sort of dissenting idea that there's some sort of difference between a state sponsored church establishment and a school board writing a prayer. I, and to me, that line is, <laughs> I'm not sure where I put that line. I guess I just, I, <laughs> I was waiting for you to I draw the line in the I sand. I don't understand. I really, I, and I'm not trying to just be argumentative with this. I actually don't understand what the su- supposed difference is between the church of England, that kind of state established religion uh-huh. and a board of regents writing a prayer, that kind of state established religion. Uh-huh. I don't understand what the functional difference between those two things is supposed to be. So anyway, one is smaller. Is that the whole, yeah, argument? that's my thing. Is it just the scope and scale? Yeah. Like, it, like just because it's for the public schools of New York is different than the whole church of England. Yeah. I'm just trying to guess what that statement would be. I am, I am too. I'm very curious. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then the other case that was related to this is Abington School District versus Shemp. And this was consolidated with another case, which was uh, Murray v. Carlett. And this involved Edward Shemp, who was a Unitarian Universalist from Abington Township, PA. He felt that his son Ellery was pressured and excluded by mandatory Bible readings and prayer in Pennsylvania public schools. Shemp was initially ruled against in the state courts, and he appealed to the Supreme Court, which consolidated this case with this other one that challenged similar practices in Maryland. And then in this uh, big 1963 decision, the court sided with the Shemps, the Supreme Court sided with the Shemps, declaring that school-sponsored Bible readings and prayers were unconstitutional. The reasoning again rested on the Establishment Clause, which prohibits government endorsement of religion and the potential for coercion even with opt-out options. 
This coercion question is to me very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I was talking with my dad about some of this. We were kind of arguing a little bit back and forth about this. But I was recalling a couple of things that happened in my high school. I was trying to get really particular about where this line of coercion gets drawn Mm -hmm. when it comes to religion in public schools. I recall being asked to read prayers and... At the time, I wouldn't have objected to doing this for any number of reasons, but it also wouldn't have been something that I necessarily felt like I had an option to say no to. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's what I was really trying to, I was really trying to investigate and uncover. Yeah, I just, was it coercive? Maybe it might have been a little bit in a way that now makes me uncomfortable looking back on that, in that... Students are expected to defer to authority figures in public schools, in schools in general. You know, when an adult asks you to do something, you're not really expected to be like, no, thank you. I don't want to do that. Uh And because of that, I don't want to consider students to be capable of exercising choice in the same way that we think of adults being capable of exercising choice. Like, oh, you could choose not to do this thing is resting a lot on the shoulders of students who are typically expected to follow rules yeah. in this setting. And who would feel the pressure of, you know, Yeah, there is pressure. Is asking there is them. pressure. Even if it doesn't feel like bad pressure at the time because you agree with the thing, it still is a force that is compelling You've been you. encouraged, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I wouldn't have objected to it at the time. But now looking back on it, I'm like, is that something I would have chosen to do had it not been prompted. Oh, okay. You know, like... So that's the line for you? I, no, sure I don't know you... where the line oh, okay. is. I really don't know where the line is. I understand. Uh, I don't know if... The, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but that's my question to myself looking back on my own experience. Like, oh, hey, there was a time <laughs> when I was asked to do something where this that... this was... Yeah. 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 Expected. Yeah. Sure. So... To 1969. Yes. Here we have Tinker versus Des Moines Independent Community School. Yes. In this case, address student First Amendment rights, ruling that students have the right to wear symbolic speeches, in this case armbands, and protest unless it causes substantial disruption to the learning environment. Yes. This phrase of substantial disruption, you're probably familiar with this as a person who uh-huh. has to deal with students. Substantial expressing- disruptions? <laughs> yeah. You have to I'm familiar with-, with disruptions. Yes. Carry on. You must deal with students expressing themselves sometimes disruptively. So you might be familiar with this test that they call the Tinker Test. Mm -hmm. So the story is, Mm -hmm. in 1965, five students in Des Moines, Iowa, decided to wear black armbands as a silent protest against American involvement in the Vietnam War. Despite warnings and policies against the armbands put in place by the school administration, siblings John, Mary Beth, Hope, and Paul Tinker and a friend of theirs, Christopher Eckhart, wore the bands and faced suspension for violating a dress code band. By the way, one of those kids, I don't remember which one, but one of them was like eight years old. I think it might have been Paul. I had a baby Paul. <laughs> eight year old. Okay. Listing their um, names, it felt like I was doing the Night John Boy. Yes. I felt yes. Like I was doing. yes. The Waltons. The mm-hmm. Walton family. Good night. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they, those, that group, they challenged the school's authority, sparking the landmark case, Tinker v. Des Moines which reached the Supreme Court. So ultimately, the Supreme Court sided with the students in a 7-2 decision, ruling that the students' First Amendment rights extended to their peaceful expression, even within the schoolhouse, as long as it did not materially disrupt the educational environment. The black armbands, deemed symbolic speech, were found not to pose such a threat, solidifying the principle of students' rights to free expression within reasonable limits. So these kids showed up wearing just plain black armbands, and the school was like they might nope. have had some sort of symbol on it that and made then it oh okay it was, so then it ended up being i understand I'd, but still yeah, I think an armband I, yeah i yeah. mean when you and i were coming up through school we graduated then what 2008 from high school uh-huh. i mean my school still had a rule back then that you couldn't have colored hair like dyed colored hair <laughs> yeah and i always thought that was the dumbest hill now I, that wasn't a as you know. charged in an issue as the Vietnam War? No, yeah. but like that, I remember my friends like doing their hair and then being like, they told me that this is disrupting education. Oh, there's a case in, what is it, Texas right now yeah. involving a student trying to wear braids, a black student wearing braids, yeah. and it's against school district policy. 
But I'm saying like you and I are not even so old that like there weren't these what I would consider stupid rules that we were forced to follow. And that wasn't even an act of, you know what I mean? Like in this case. Yeah. In that case, you're just like expressing that you want to have a hair color. In this case, you're expressing that you're against the Vietnam war. Right. Uh, and I'm not trying to compare those things. Sorry, but I'm just suggesting no, no. that yeah. the, the actual disruption of education for something to actually disrupt my class, it has to be a lot more than an armband or a haircut. Yeah. Like it would like you would have to be yourself glow you would have to be a radium girl to disrupt my class. <laughs> like unless you yourself were glowing, I don't even know <laughs> what the disruption could be. Yeah. Like if you came into my suit in like an inflatable T Rex outfit, I would be like, This is a pain in the butt, but I'll keep teaching. That would be a, a substantial disruption, I think. Depending that, on where you sit, it could be. I think that might pass the <laughs> Or I guess maybe fail the tinker test. <laughs> I don't know if you pass it and you are disruptive or you fail and you are disruptive, but I, I don't think it would do well on a tinker test. <laughs> have you passed or have you failed? That's up to you. Yeah, I That's don't know. up to your goal. <laughs> that is kind of the discussion question that I have for this case. And that's, has the meaning of material disruption changed since Tinker versus Des Moines? So this is specifically about cases where you have decided we're talking to about the freedom of statement. expression. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I'm You're, with you. It's about... I got First hung up on the rights. disruption of a classroom, in which case... Yes, there are many ways to disrupt a classroom yeah. that don't necessarily involve First yes. Amendment Sorry. rights. No, no, you don't need to. But but I do think it's an interesting question, especially with like social media and online communication. How yeah. do these things impact what constitutes a substantial disruption? Yeah. You've dealt with kids saying things on Snapchat yeah. that completely blow up the school dynamic for an entire week. Can we week. not use that phrase, please? Um... <laughs> They completely disrupt the school dynamic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I didn't mean literally. No, I'm just joking. I just love that the eight-year-old was like, I'll do it. You know that sibling was like, everybody yeah. else is doing the it. The little too. kid brother is implicated in the Supreme <laughs> Court. I think only maybe two or three of the the kids were actually party to the lawsuit. It wasn't like all yeah. of them were involved in sure. the actual lawsuit. But anyway, that's Tinker versus Des Moines. Yep. Okay. This next case... This one has ripple effects that we talk about probably every single episode of this show. This is the case of San Antonio Independent School District versus Rodriguez. This is from 1973. And this case upheld significant disparities in school funding across districts, despite concerns about equal access to education. And this obviously sparked an ongoing debate about educational equity in this country. I was reading, there's a Time magazine retrospective about this, the piece was called something about like the worst Supreme Court decision since 1960 or something. And this was in there. Um, it Great. Ranked... <laughs> Why so, did these keep winning? Yeah. This stupid award. So here's the situation. Texas public elementary and secondary schools rely on local property uh-huh. taxes to supplement school revenues. Yep. So Rodriguez, acting on behalf of students whose families live in poorer school districts in Texas, challenged this funding scheme by arguing that it underprivileged students, certain students, because their schools lacked property tax bases that other districts could utilize. So basically, the situation is this relying on accessible, taxable property causes these really bad interdistrict disparities in per pupil spending. Yeah. And much like again, we still see. Yes, today. we talk about this time and time again, and Ohio is dealing with it right now, and this is still very much <laughs> an issue for public schools. So basically because there are similarities between the way Texas's system works and other state systems work, it's clear the court was like it's it's fine because it's uh, not quote so irrational as to be invidiously discriminatory That's end a, quote yeah they're like well everybody does it this way therefore it, <laughs> it can't, can't be, be discriminatory that bad. <laughs> that's like the worst hill invidiously discriminatory okay so the 5-4 decision ruled that there was no basically there's no textual basis for saying that you have a constitutional right yes. to an equal education and that therefore there's no violation of rights in the texas school system the funding model and then I just want to note that in 1992, I love this follow The Supreme Court ended up ruling that Texas's school financing method was unconstitutional in a 7 2 decision. <laughs> oh, and you there don't have been say. another, uh, uh, there have been a number of other state Supreme Courts that have ruled that their state's funding models are unconstitutional. And that's because state constitutions will sometimes explicitly enumerate the right to a public education where our federal constitution does not do that. So that that's actually what happened here in Ohio. We were we just recently went through this new funding 
model process because the state Supreme Court ruled that Ohio's funding funding model was unconstitutional. So anyway, I love the update. Anyway, so in 1992, they all said that was a lie, (laughs) basically is what happened there. (laughs) So it seems like a lot of people are trying to leverage the Equal Protection Clause to have a decent education. So this clause guarantees equal protection under the law for all citizens. And obviously there are people arguing that denying access to quality public education creates unequal opportunity, which violates the clause. I guess my question is just like, what do we do about this? Because we're about to look at a number of other cases that deal with the Equal Protection Clause and and student rights to certain resources. (laughs) And I just, I don't know, I guess maybe in my lifetime, if it were to happen that legislators at the federal level decided that education should be a right, that would be a, that would be a a universal right. That would be a big win. But I don't see how that would be possible. Mm Mm-hmm. But yeah, this comes down to a huge hodgepodge of relying on state constitutions. And then the Supreme Court ends up stepping in and saying whether or not it violates state constitutions. But yeah, people have failed over and over again to make a textual argument for the right to an equal education, basically. Okay, next case, also kind of related to this. Okay, Lau versus Nichols, 1974. So this case addressed the needs of non-English speaking students requiring schools to provide meaningful language assistance to ensure equal educational opportunities. So in 1971, the San Francisco, California school system was integrated and enrolled over 2,856 students of Chinese descent who were not proficient in English. The school system only provided about a thousand of these students with supplemental English language courses. Otherwise, classes in San Francisco schools were taught exclusively in English. Lao and students of Chinese ancestry who did not speak English and received no supplemental English instruction brought this class action lawsuit against the officials in San Francisco Unified School District. The students claimed that the failure to provide supplemental English classes created an unequal educational opportunity in violation of the 14th Amendment and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So the Supreme Court unanimously determined that the school system's failure to provide supplemental English language instruction constituted a violation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, but they ignored the uh, 14th Amendment arguments, essentially. Yeah, So there have been subsequent challenges to this ruling that have weakened the foundation of the Lao decision. This is an interesting one because this is one that schools, especially in Ohio right now, have been dealing with, with a influx of of students who are coming into districts that are not proficient in English Mm -hmm. and how we don't have the support for those types of learners. Yeah. Yikes. This case is interesting, and we're going to see in a second another case called Board of Ed versus Rowley that uh, deals with IEPs, which seem to deliver a decision that kind of conflicts with this Lao decision. But yeah, this is another case where there's a 14th Amendment challenge that the court is like, yeah, I don't really see it, (laughs) because we're once again trying to argue that the Equal Protection Clause somehow guarantees something about my school experience, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's the argument, and that's the argument that the Supreme Court was like, yeah, not really, but we do find issues here with this ruling with regard to the Civil Rights Act of 64. So, yeah, I guess what what are the ongoing challenges for English language learners in public schools? Most of it's money to support them. Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest one. Also, like... Not in my my district, but in central Ohio, there's been an influx of a lot of different types of speakers. And so, yeah, English language those... learning means that, I mean, you could have any number of students speaking any number of yeah. native languages that yeah. are not English. <laughs> and so some of the some of the groups that are, you know, ending up in Ohio are, are not things that many people in Ohio can speak is one challenge. Right. Um but I would say that probably the biggest issue is the money to fund the support, either finding um, speakers of that language to help or to help fund technology that could make translating accessible, you know, like that type of thing. It's, mm-hmm. it's a money game. That's yeah. what's hard. So we've got a Supreme Court decision that says that you must accommodate those students, mm-hmm. but also a Supreme Court decision that says 
it's constitutional to have a funding model that makes it impossible for you to accommodate those students. Yeah. Both of those things are true at the yes. same time. <laughs> so those are those are really, really big struggles, I would say, for schools to afford the the care and the education and the support for. Yeah. Okay. This next one, we're going to revisit this in our next episode because there was a very recent Supreme Court case about affirmative action in college admissions. But this is the or- kind of one of the original cases that kicked off that ongoing conversation. This is from 1978, Regents of the University of California versus Backey. And this case addressed like we said, affirmative action in college admissions, the court ruled that a specific quota system used by the University of California was unconstitutional, but it did not ban affirmative action in college admissions altogether. And this case very much continues to shape discussions about how universities can create diverse student bodies. So this case was about Alan Backey, who was a 35-year-old white man who applied twice to the University of California Medical School at Davis and was rejected both times. At somewhere along the line, it was insinuated that maybe his age was playing a factor, like, like you're too old, but mm-hmm. he made the case that it was his race that was the issue here. So the, the situation is that the school reserves several places in every incoming class of 100 for what they consider to be qualified minorities pursuant to the university's affirmative action program. And Becky's qualifications, including college GPA and test scores, exceeded those of any of the minority students admitted in the two years that Backey's applications were rejected. He argued that he was excluded from admission solely on the basis of race. So basically, the court upholds that these admissions criteria that Backey faced violated the Equal Protection Clause and the Civil Rights Act because a violation of the Equal Protection Clause is discrimination, which was banned by the Civil Rights Act mm-hmm. of 1964. So they're essentially saying he was discriminated against because of the color of his skin. They're saying that this protection of the Civil Rights Act and the Equal Protection Clause is not limited to the protection of only racial minorities. Right. And I think we're going to save a longer discussion of this case until part two, where we revisit the college admissions question. So anyway. All right. Next case. Okay. 1982. This is the Board of Education versus Rowley. Yes. And this case established a standard for providing education to students with disabilities and requiring schools to provide IEPs, individualized education programs, that offer meaningful access to education. Furness Woods School refused to provide a deaf student named Amy Rowley with a sign language interpreter. So this student, Amy Rowley, was an excellent lip reader. School administrators, along with a sign language expert, determined that Amy was able to succeed in school without an interpreter. And so her parents sued the school on her behalf for violation of the Education of All Handicapped Children Act of 1975. The act requires all schools that accept federal funds to provide a free, appropriate public education to all handicapped students. Yeah. This act also allows schools discretion in deciding what steps to take to accommodate handicapped students yeah the school was like it's fine she's doing fine with what we're providing her but the family had the student take a test which i believe at first was like delivered in english and Mm -hmm. the second time was delivered in asl Mm -hmm. and she performed fine on the english test but performed much better Better. on the test that was delivered in asl which suggests to me something's off yeah so they were able to determine from that test that she was obviously not um achieving to her full potential because she could do better and did do better when provided the proper accommodations. So in a 6-3 decision, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the school district. The majority opinion, written by Justice Rehnquist, held that free, appropriate public education does not require schools to provide the most optimal education, but rather an adequate and personalized education that allows the student to benefit from instruction. The Supreme Court acknowledged the challenges faced by deaf students, but found that Amy's individualized education plan, her IEP, already included various supports, such as note-taking and preferential seating. They concluded that those measures, combined with Amy's ability to lip-read and good academic performance, satisfied the FAPE requirement, which is the... Free, appropriate public education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the Rowley decision, what it did was it established a narrower definition of FAPE. 
So it focuses on the adequacy of the provided education rather than its ability to maximize a student's potential. Mm -hmm. And obviously that led to uh, debate and rightfully so criticism, um, arguing that it limited educational opportunities of disabled students and placed a really heavy burden on proving the inadequacy of those services. Yeah. Which are not fights that families, people raising them should have to be fighting. Or nor are they equipped to. No, that's right. very, it's very difficult to determine when educational services are inadequate. Right. Yeah. And like in this case, you know, Amy had family that supported her and, and knew her and um, was willing to fight for her. And yeah. not all students have that. And so it shouldn't, it shouldn't be held to that level. I yeah. <laughs> so this, this ruling, it kind of establishes another test that's sort of like the tinker test. And that's this test of free appropriate public education mm. and the test of appropriateness basically is what's at issue here and my question about this is like what constitutes an appropriate education if an educational support helps a student excel academically doesn't that mean that that support is part of that student's appropriate education I would that's, say so. my, that's my that's my question would say so. yeah. Okay, you just have to do an adequate job. You don't actually have to excel at helping students. You just have to do a, a bare minimum, an adequate, adequate. What is adequate? Mm -hmm. That's the word that I hate the most. Like, we shouldn't just be adequate, right? I mean, even like, if at we minimum, should just yes, be... But... but adequate kind of is minimum. Like, I guess I'm just saying adequate is being interpreted by this ruling as minimum. And that's where I disagree. Adequate does not mean minimum. Mm -hmm. It means appropriate to whatever circumstances that student brings with them to the table. Yeah. And I guess that's just what makes me nuts. Like, if I had some sort of learning resource that made me 500 times more likely to succeed, that resource should be part of my education. That is what makes the education adequate. Yeah. And I guess, that, yeah, I don't know. This yeah. one was this one was pretty baffling to me, I'm not going to lie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So yeah, they're like, well, luckily she can lip read, so she's fine. Like, what does that, yeah, allow for in the future? Yeah, like yeah. she could. Why would a school want to argue? Well, I, I mean, I know why. The answer is still, like you said earlier, funding. They don't have funding for it. Mm -hmm. It can't. Schools are asked to provide extraordinary resources to all kinds of students for all kinds of different reasons, and then they are bound to funding models that make it impossible mm -hmm. for them to do that. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was round one. That was round one of Supreme Court cases. We've reached the end of the list for, for this week. But I'm sufficiently this is, angry. Yeah. So that's yeah. Good. No, it definitely works me up. This sufficiently sets the stage for a conversation we'll have in our next episode where some of these prior rulings get overturned. <laughs> um, and Great. we're going to deal with more recent cases in the next episode as well. Um, we'll touch on some things that have happened even in the last couple of years. Ready for fill in the blank. I am so ready for fill in the blank. Would you like to do this episode's question or last episode's question? I'll or let you pick because I wrote them both. Okay. Why don't you do last episode's question? Okay. Tell us about football. Okay. American football started in America as a sport that was a combination of soccer and rugby. The first football game was played November 6, 1869 between Rutgers and Princeton using the rules of soccer. It was played like this until 1880 when the father of football rewrote the rules, making it more closely resemble what it looks like today. Who is the father of football? And that guy's name is Walter Camp. Way to go, Walter. Okay. Okay. The, the NFL owes you. This Our, episode. Yeah. Okay. This episode's question. Today, when this episode comes out, is a leap day. Every four years, we have a February 29th, like today, but in 1712, there was one country that had February 30th. They'd gone from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian and then returned to the Julian. These switches created quite the issue, one that could partially be solved by adding an extra day in February, leading to a February 30th. So what was this country? And fun fact, in 1753, this country switched to the Gregorian for good, and the calendar was so messed up that they had to go from February 17th to March 1st 
And people were a little bit peeved that they uh, suddenly had missed 11 days of their lives. They had messed up their calendar so severely and all of these switches that they had to recalibrate by 11 days. That's a lot. Can you imagine how now, if that happened, how much chaos would would like banking systems the internet would disintegrate like oh just 11 days don't exist anymore like what do you mean yeah i think the world would grind to a halt it would i'm glad we figured out the calendar before the internet came around yeah i'm glad this country figured it out also you would enjoy this chelsea because this is who you are as a person i also read that in the world of lord of the rings oh boy they Uh have a february 30th do they? Something in the writing suggests that every month has 30 days. Okay. Take that for what you will. The hobbits are very regular people. I like that about them. probably be the kings of Numenor who established the calendar. So I anyways, <laughs> um, that was the... That was this episode's fill in the blank. Where you send us You didn't see answer. it, but I just transformed. Like, I just, like... A, 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 a cloud came over my face, and I transformed her eyes into rolled to fantasy the back. nerd. Yeah, her eyes rolled. To the I back became of Smeagol. Okay. okay, sorry. So, if you haven't before, write in. Let us know what country you think muffed it so badly that they had to get rid of eleven days in a year. And yes, it's not anything from The Hobbit. No. Uh, yeah, it's so a real country. Please do write into us for your fill in the blank answers. Hello at sixteen to one dot com if you know we'll the answer. Send you stickers. Yeah, we will send you stickers if you get the right answer, or even if you don't get the right also answer. We'll send you stickers. Yeah, we will. Okay, what'd you learn? Oh well, I was really picking on Dartmouth this week, so I'll, I'll sh- share something that I learned about. Dartmouth. I also picked on Dartmouth so much so that I already forgot where they are. I learned that the Daily Student newspaper, which is now called the Dartmouth, but was originally called the Dartmouth Gazette, and I actually linked to an article from um, them in the show notes, the one about the students. That's where that information came from. It's America's oldest college newspaper. Its first issue was published in 1799 under the original motto, which I enjoyed, Here range the world, explore the dense and rare, and view all nature in your elbow chair. I like that. I love a student newspaper with a bit of humor. I was in that world very much in college. I started a student newspaper with a bit of humor. Surprises me. Not at all. Yeah. No, that was very much my jam. So I I appreciated the motto. and uh, It is a good motto. I do agree. I like the motto a lot. And they're still uh, regularly publishing at the Dartmouth. So Where to go? That's what I learned. My favorite university in New Hampshire, somewhere in New England, maybe Connecticut, maybe I, Maine. No, when, earlier I said not Connecticut because I knew it was not Connecticut or Maine because those were the two last time I was like probably. Anyways, here's what I learned. Okay, Chelsea, yeah. Thanks for asking. What did? Okay. Well, I would love to know what you learned. So, the NCAA football game by EA Sports is returning this year. Uh Uh-huh. I've heard you talk about this fabled game of old. It has... Okay, yeah. Um, It's only been 10 years, but okay. (laughs) Just over 10 years. (laughs) Your youth. Now you're talking like you're on The Hobbit. Cool. Okay. (laughs) So the NCAA football game is returning after more than 10 years, where it has not been released, because EA, the company, had to quit production because of concerns about NIL deals, name, image, and likeness. Ah. And they were sued. Uh huh. They don't like that. So they were using people's likenesses without really a structure, or mm-hmm. legal structure mm-hmm. to do so. Okay. Now, because the NCAA is allowing NIL deals, that allowed for the game to come back. Wow. And they started production in 2021, and it's set to come out this summer, to which I'm very excited, and we'll probably have to cancel all episodes this summer because I'll be very busy. <laughs> so recently, EA opened up that athletes can opt themselves into the game to be featured as a player on their roster. And if an athlete chose to be included, they receive a copy of the game and a payment of $600. Well, there you have it. Yeah. So um, EA is also making deals with other bigger stars, obviously college football stars to be featured more prominently and to help them do some press and media and things Mm -hmm. like that. But any player, even if you're on the Akron Zips, you can pay six hundred or you can be paid six hundred dollars and get a copy of the game for allowing yourself to be in it. The Akron Zips. Yeah. Which I think is very cool. Okay. So it's it's coming back. Okay. I think that about wraps it for the week. Any uh final thoughts on di- the difficulty of Supreme Court cases? I think I've said everything I could possibly say about that. Okay. 
Thank we'll you. see you in two weeks with more. We sure will. Talk to you in two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Listeners, thanks for supporting 16 to 1. We're your co-hosts. I'm Chelsea Adams. And I'm Katie Day. Find our show notes, archives, and resources, sign up for our newsletter, or get in touch with us via the contact form at 16to1.com, all spelled out. We are so grateful for our listener support. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing to the show and telling your friends or colleagues about it. The show is edited and produced by you, Chelsea Adams, and you're also responsible for our show's music. And you, Katie Day, serve as lead researcher and social media manager. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next show. American football started in America as a sport that was a combination of suck. Of suck. (laughs) A combination of suck. Sucker and rugby. A combination. Sucker and rugby. (laughs) A combination. (laughs) 